welcome City Wealth viewers. I am delighted this morning to welcome Paula Steele and she is Director at John Lamb Hill Aldridge. Welcome Paula, how are you? I'm well thank you Karen, how are you in these old times? <laughs> Well, looking forward to the Bojo announcement today. Who knows what the world will bring for us. But delighted to chat with you this morning. So tell the viewers, who are you? And tell us about your organisation, which is newly formed. Okay, we're John Lamb Hill Aldridge. Um, people will perhaps know us better as John Lamb. But we sold our wealth management business, which had been a very large part of our business, uh, almost, well, just over a year ago now. And we set up a specialist life insurance brokerage, which also does some equity release. And in July, we acquired another life insurance brokerage. So we're now probably the largest specialist life insurance brokerage in the UK. Day to day, Paula, tell me what you do. Well, most of my life is given over to talking to individuals about their needs for protection insurance. The vast majority of what we do is for inheritance tax and most of what we do is referred to us by other professionals. So a lot of the time I'm talking to other professionals, asking them what their clients, what they think their client will need and then talking to the client to find out what the client thinks they need, which can be a bit different. Yeah. And so in terms of industry trends and, and not necessarily just focused on your business, what are the kind of things that you're seeing are key issues with um, ultra high net worth clients today? I think the, there's no doubt about it that through lockdown, the ultra high net worth clients have been much, much more focused on their own affairs. So if we talk to the solicitors, they will all tell you that their clients have become much more focused and much more into really thinking at a much deeper level about the future, about intergenerational transfers, about how they're going to structure their wealth, um, not only for themselves, but also for their children and the ongoing generations. And so I think that for ultra high net worth clients, that, that, that having a bit more time to really think through what they want to do is, has been the big trend of lockdown. And I think the what, one thing that busy entrepreneurs might not know is that they are generally, as a group, extremely bad at doing that, aren't they? And they're so kind of known for it, aren't they? If like always putting that off as a message, a message. So I guess that is a good thing, isn't it, in terms of them sorting out their planning for their families? Yes, I think so. I, I, think, I think that they are thinking about it. I think they will, a lot of them are putting their investment managers up for review. Um, I think they're probably, they, I don't see any evidence at the moment that there's a lot of money on a merry-go-round with people going from one manager to another. But certainly when I'm talking to people, they, whether telling the manager, or not they've definitely got the managers under review in terms of what they've achieved through this lockdown and what they think they will achieve going forward really interesting so give us an, uh, a really good take on the equity release which is a huge topic now and you gave me some very good thoughts previously about certain age groups should do it and other age groups should not so give us the lowdown on equity release i think the there's a big takeaway on the equity release is that you've got interest rates now which are fixed for life at about 2.3 percent and i think that the equity release market there's been much less demand through lockdown that people are talking about a 40 percent drop and i think that we've seen we've certainly seen a drop off in for inquiries which has quite surprised us because interest rates have never been so low and i don't think we'll go much lower um, the product has changed dramatically in that it's much, much more flexible than it used to be. And I think there are a lot of clients who are going to be short of cash flow because their dividends have dropped and that the capital value that they've got in their pension funds has dropped. And I think that, that you know, look at a client who's got, say, a million pounds in the house and, say, 300,000 in the pension fund, maybe multiply those by 10. Um, and the pension fund is having to provide 100% of the income while the house is sitting there 
and not providing any of the cash flows. And I think people will come to think about that. The other part of the market, which is doing equity release to gift, that's really a question of whether, and for that, that's really about people in their 80s and 90s who are wanting to transfer money to the next generation and don't have any liquid assets to transfer and then equity release. Because for the equity release, it, it's effectively being paid for by the next generation. So they're having to pay the 2.3, that interest rate is deductible, so it's well under 1.5%, and they get hold of the money now, um, and their parents are really unaffected by it all. Well, that's really interesting. So some hot seat questions. The problem with equity release, it seems, uh, is that people are quite scared of it, like timeshares. They feel like a lot of stuff has gone wrong and there's a, a shroud of darkness around the, the industry. So give us some, what's gone wrong and what can you do right for clients to understand this? I think what's gone wrong is that people have seen it as something that, you know, you look at all those ads on the telly, which show somebody in their 60s taking money out to go on a cruise or buy a new car um, and they're too young really to do equity release and there's no doubt about it in the 80s and maybe even in the 90s but you know that's 20 years ago um, there was some very poor practice we now have the equity release council you have to have additional exams the fca has got the spotlight on it so that the, and the pi insurers have got the spotlight on it so those poor practices, I don't think, continue forward. I, I feel actually very strongly that it's a very, a very valid way of people thinking not only about providing additional cash flow. You know, people's houses are subject to inheritance tax. The money they've got in their pension fund is not. Um, that there's quite a lot to say that you need a balance. Take some of your income needs out of the house, take some of them out of your pension fund. And I think that as, as holistic financial planners begin to put equity release in as an option, I think it will get more credibility. Yeah. But at the moment, I think it's got a sort of quite a whiff around it. Yeah. I think that it's unfortunate, isn't it? Because it's a technique which can be useful but I'm afraid it has definitely got some tarnished reputation on it. A whiff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so give us just a little bit of a lay down about you and your background and history and then we'll finish off but thank you so much. Oh it's my pleasure. Well I've been working for the John Land business for 42 years now um, and in that time at one level nothing has changed and another level it's changed hugely. Um, in that clients still have needs. We've always been very much a needs-based practice, sorting out what people need and then trying to help them to deal with those needs. Um, it, it, so it hasn't changed in that way. Regulation has changed out of all recognition. Um, there, was an there was originally a John Lamb, and he wrote needs-based reports they are pretty similar to the reports that we write today. They were rather shorter and they had a lot less paperwork attached to them. But effectively, you're doing the same thing today as a quality advisor was doing then. Find out where the client is, find out what they need, and then help them to get there. That's really what a financial planner does. And we happen to supply into a very specific area in terms of their protection. But most of that is about making sure that, that what they want to achieve in terms of an intergenerational transfer of assets, they can do so. And a lot of what we do is about cash flow, about clients saying, if I die, what is the, how is the cash flow going to work? And that's really been quite problematical. You know, if, if you particularly got assets that you can't sell very easily, then insurance will, will provide you with that cash flow. And it, it, we've, of course, had issues because we haven't been able to get medicals done during when we were in lockdown, but we can now. The insurance industry hasn't, isn't charging anything more for term insurance in a post-COVID world. They are charging a lot more for whole-of-life cover. But 
um, they are being very picky about who they will insure. Okay, so, so people need a device from someone like yourself. So thank you so much, Paula. It's been an absolute pleasure and we look forward to seeing you soon. Well, let's see, see what happens with Bojo, but thank you so much. Thank you so much. Talk soon.